Good morning. Once again, Sunday morning, April 17th, and I'm Wimala, and I'll be with you for 30 minutes today if you choose. So today is the, uh, the world, the Western world, and lots of the Eastern world are celebrating Easter, and there are almost every other large religious group, probably lots of small ones, are also celebrating this time of year. So uh, for everyone, I hope you're enjoying your holiday with your loved ones or in, in, uh, in contemplation or meditation. You're spending the day with yourself. Uh, and I hope it's not as cold <laughs> where you are as it is where I am. We've got beautiful sun, but I think we're having a cold, cold next several days. But it's the uh, Southern Asia New Year and Easter and Ramadan and Passover, all these holidays are being, are taking place all on this rather auspicious time for the world. So maybe all the, if that energy can be harnessed and bring a little peace to the world, that would be wonderful. So what, whoop, did I lose my place? I wanted to read, a, uh, there are a couple of essays in the book I'm reading, Gil Fronsdale's book, The Issue at Hand, and I thought they would be, here we go, I thought they would be interesting to read because it's this is this time of spring when the season changes from winter to spring. So it's that it's a kind of resurrection for the for the earth, and uh, that's built into to I'm sure built into the times that we celebrate these holidays. So the earth is waking up from the winter. We're moving into that new life that we see, and the grass is green here now, and little flowers are beginning to show their uh, green leaves. So the two essays I'd like to read are called Being a Naturalist, is the first one. It's very short. And then According with Nature is the second. And I think this is a good day to be thinking about nature. So Dhammapada 49 is an inspiration for the first one. As a bee gathers nectar and moves on without harming the flower, its color, or its fragrance, just so should a sage move through a village, being a naturalist. In mindfulness meditation, we learn to be present for things as they are, in doing so, it can be useful to assume the attitude of a naturalist. A naturalist simply observes nature without interfering or imposing his or her views. If a bear eats a deer, it, <laughs> I'm just reading in any animal I want. If a wolf eats a deer, a naturalist watches without judgment. If a plant produces stunning, stunningly beautiful blossoms, a naturalist leaves it alone, not succumbing to the desire to take it home. In meditation, we observe ourselves, much as a naturalist observes nature, without repressing, denying, or grasping, or defending anything. That's very good, very important sentence. I'm going to read that again. We should all just memorize it. In meditation, we observe ourselves much as a naturalist observes nature without repressing, denying, grasping, or defending anything. This means that we observe our life with a non-interfering presence. We can see our anger, depression, fear, happiness, joy, pain, and pleasure directly, as they are, without complications. The naturalist perspective is one of respect for what is observed. The word respect is a nice synonym for mindfulness practice. 
because it literally means to look again. Often we complicate our observation of ourselves by taking things personally. It's probably more than often, it's probably about 99% of the time. Of course, we can't deny <clears throat> that our sorrows and joys, challenges and blessings, emotions and thoughts are happening to us. But when we take them personally, we let ourselves be defined by them. The presence of anger means I am an angry person. A generous act, a generous act taken personally is proof that I am a generous person. While the common tendency of taking things personally may seem innocent, it often unnecessarily complicates our relationship with what is happening. We can easily become muddled in confusion regarding such issues as personal identity, image, and expectation. From the naturalist perspective, one does not see my anger or my generosity. Rather, they are simply observed as the anger or the impulse of generosity. Such a switch of perspective can be particularly helpful with physical pain. When taken personally, my pain can easily lead to burdensome feelings of responsibility and entanglement. When we see it as the pain, it tends to be easier for us to remain disengaged and lighter. Another way we complicate our lives is by assigning values of good or bad to our experiences. For a naturalist, there is no good or bad. The natural world just unfolds. During mindfulness meditation, we don't need to judge our experience as either good or bad. We simply watch how things are and how they unfold. By cultivating a naturalist perspective during meditation, it is possible to develop a capacity to be non-reactive. From this non-reactive perspective, we can more easily explain how to respond wisely to whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Once we have seen clearly, there may well be a need for action or involvement. For example, a naturalist may decide to remove a non-native plant from a delicate ecosystem. Likewise, through non-relatively witnessing our anger or greed, we may decide to uproot them. Because of our wonderful powers of observation and reflection, human beings can be both observer and observed. We can be both the naturalist and the nature. We are nature seeing itself. Through our capacity to see clearly, we can be nature freeing itself. I think I'm going to go ahead and read the, uh, the next one, which is According with Nature. Who once was inattentive but now is not, illumines the world like the moon set free from a cloud. And that's from Dhammapada 172. According with nature, all spiritual practice involves change or a wish for change to go from a state of suffering to a state without suffering, to go from agitation to calm, to go from a closed heart to an open, compassionate heart. When people first come to a spiritual practice, the desire, even the need for change is often quite clear. Conversely, in some advanced Buddhist practices, the desire for change may be so subtle that it may go unnoticed. For example, one may learn the practice of simply accepting things as they are without wanting change. But even here there is change from a state of non-acceptance to a state of acceptance. 
it is important for us to reflect on our relationship to the process of seeking change. Are there healthy and unhealthy ways of bringing about change? <clears throat> One way to think of this is to look at the distinction between change that accords with nature and change as an act of ego. Consider how a skillful gardener supports the growth of a flower. The gardener doesn't tug on a seed sprout to help the plant grow or pull open the petals to open a blossom. Rather, he or she nourishes and protects the plant and so lets it grow and flower in line with its nature. In the same way, much of what sustains our life occurs without our needing to intervene. For example, the body knows how to take care of itself in a way that the mind could never possibly understand. The conscious mind cannot control everything related to the pumping of the heart, the circulation of blood, and the working of the immune system. What our bodies do without our conscious awareness is simply astounding. Our main role in these processes is to nourish and protect. In contract to this natural unfolding, there is change imposed by the ego out of our insecurity, fear, hostility, greed, or ambition. And because of our phenomenal ability for abstract thinking, we easily impose our world of ideas on top of nature rather than patiently allowing nature to show us what is needed and how we can come into accord with it. One concept <clears throat> we often impose on our experience is an assumption of permanence which can put us at odds with the inherent impermanence of all natural processes. Another concept that can inhibit the expression of our nature is a fixed image of ourselves, which can easily propel us to conform to shoulds and shouldn'ts. I believe that spiritual practice unfolds most smoothly when we find how to accord ourselves with nature. A useful metaphor for this is a river. To enter the spiritual life fully is to enter a stream that eventually carries you to the great ocean. All you have to do is to get into the river and stay in it. Trust, persistence, mindfulness, clarity, and insight help us float in the river. Once we are floating, the nature of a river is to carry us effortlessly to the ocean. If we fight the river, if we fight against the current, we can exhaust ourselves trying to go against the natural flow. <laughs> the river metaphor is quite different from the popular metaphor that likens a spiritual path to climbing a mountain, which suggests hard, constant, and willful uphill effort and can lend itself to an ego-driven personality. The trek is hard, suggesting that not everyone can make it. The mountain peak may be quite narrow, suggesting it can only hold a few people at a time. In contrast, the ocean is big enough to hold everyone. The river metaphor is expressive of a practice of according with nature, with truth. This does not mean that spiritual practice requires nothing of us. A fast river may require our attention and navigation to stay in the current, off the rocks, and out of the eddies. Practice requir requires mindfulness and investigation, supported by calmness and inner stability, to discover nature and how to accord ourselves with it. Often this entails learning how to leave ourselves alone, how not to interfere with the natural unfolding and healing that will occur if we give them a chance. Our conscious mind may not know what is supposed to unfold. Like a flower that needs water and fertilizer, our inner life opens in its varied ways when it is ready, if we nourish it with attentiveness, compassion, and acceptance. To work with nature, we need to study it thoroughly. 
One way to do this is to investigate all the ways we work against nature by being judgmental, hostile, demanding, hurried, unkind, or ungenerous. Another important way to study nature is through mindfulness of the body. Our bodies are, after all, a clear expression of nature. The body is perhaps our most intimate connection to nature. To be mindful of the body is to be interested in what wants to move within the body, what wants expression. Many of our volitions, desires, fears, aspirations, understandings, and emotions reside in the body. To resist nature is to keep these frozen within the body. But the opposite, to act on them blindly, also goes against nature. To accord with nature is to discover that you are nature. In Buddhism, there is a saying, those who practice the Dharma are protected by the Dharma. Another way of saying this is that those who practice in accord with nature are protected by nature. Those who practice the truth are in turn protected by the truth. May you all be protected by your nature. I really like those two. We don't have a lot of time, so I'd like to um, just sit with you a few minutes and we can do, just be with our breath and, and uh, be aware. Maybe you are outside. If you're sitting outside and have a warm, sunny space where you're, you're in nature. I'm looking out at nature, but it's a little bit cold. I'm going for a walk later today, so I, I will be out in nature. So that's, I can bundle up for that and be ready for that. So we are protected by nature. I like that. And so we can think of ourselves, if you're a meditator, that you're a naturalist. So we're exploring our own nature within nature. So let's sit together and then, then I want to end with my wish and just let that be part of the meditation. So let's be with the breath. You may be busy with preparations for getting together with others today, or you may have done that yesterday. You may be just hoping to spend a quiet day. So even a short practice can be very helpful to give you what you want from the day, just to inspire you to be focusing be sure you're also focusing on yourself and how you're interacting with your world and with the, with with nature and even as you breathe you can also be scanning through your body from top to bottom or from the bottom to the top. Being aware of how you feel. You can, you can be looking at, when you scan your body, you can be looking at those feelings of pleasant and unpleasant is very lightly being aware of that other those other areas that we're looking at when we're practicing mindfulness noticing what the basic tonal qualities are in your body
There may be parts of you that feel pleasant feelings. There may be other parts, parts of you that are, that have unpleasant feelings. And you can see it changing too from moment to moment, from hour to hour. And understanding that, seeing that as part of mindfulness practice. A short body scan is a very good way to start a meditation. Allow your body just to be comfortable and relaxed, but awake. May I become at all, at all times, both now and forever, a protector for those without protection, a guide for those who have lost their way, a ship for those with an ocean to cross, a sanctuary for those in danger, a lamp for those without light, a place of refuge for those who lack shelter, and a servant to all in need. By means of this meritorious deed, may I never join with the unwise, only the wise, until the time I find awakening. May everything we do and say and think today be done not only for our own benefit and our own happiness, but also for the benefit and happiness of all sentient beings. So thank you. Enjoy the day and we can be, be part of nature and enjoy observing things as they are. Okay, thank you so much for being part of my practice. Bye-bye.